Welcome to this episode of Criminal Mischief, the Art and Craft of Crime Fiction. Today I want to talk about point of view, um, particularly as it relates to writing crime fiction. Point of view can be tricky. As you know, it's first, second, third, and omniscient point of view. It can be single or multiple when it comes to third person, and we're going to go through some of this. The first important decision I think a writer must make when he's getting ready to tell a story is that who is telling the story? Whose story is it? This would likely be <clears throat> the point of view character. Um, Harry Bosch, you know, and the Michael Connolly things, uh, he's the point of view character. He drives the story. Uh, Jack Reacher uh, in, in the Lee Child series, uh, Jack uh, drives the story, and he's a point of view character and the main point of view character through those stories. Um, but that's not always the case. There's been some wonderful stories where the protagonist is not the point of view character, but rather it's an observer, obviously Scout and To Kill a Mockingbird and Nick in The Great Gatsby are, are wonderful examples um, of this, where the point of view character, the one telling the story, is uh, not the protagonist of the story. Why would someone do this? Well, I think it offers insight into the main character that they wouldn't see themselves. Um, they may not have that insight into themselves that someone else observing from the outside. Obviously, Nick had a fascination with Gatsby. Uh, he wasn't always kind in what he thought about Gatsby, but his point of view really changed that how we viewed as the reader that character. And with Scout, obviously she worshipped her father, and she told this story, you know, from her child point of view, which added so much depth to the story because it was about justice and racism and all that stuff in, in the South way back when. And uh, Scout offered the child's view that that simplified that complex issue and made it so understandable and so poignant to the reader. And I think it had it been told from Atticus's point of view, her father, Atticus Finch, it wouldn't have had the same impact. So that was a great choice there. The other question you have to ask is, is your narrator, your point of view character, reliable? Are they understanding what's going on correctly? Are they misinformed or, or misguided? And, and, and this sometimes can be powerful short storytelling because the reader now has to figure out, I'm following this character through this story. I'm in their point of view. Can I believe everything that they believe? How many point of view characters do you need? How, how many is too few and how many is too many? Well, the rule of thumb is the fewer the better because you don't want to confuse the reader with 20 different points of view. Um, you're seeing the story from a lot of different different perspectives. It becomes disjointed. There's no through line, if you will. And I think it dilutes your point of view character, and, which is usually the protagonist, by having too many. But however many it takes to tell the story. It, in, uh, and obviously in first person, pure first person, it's all one person. But if you're using multiple third, you have to decide how, how you're going to dole out the storytelling. And I think what you decide is which characters you're going to use is to which characters know too little to drive the story or know too much and might spoil the story. Those are the kind of characters you want to to shy away from. So in other words, the character that you're following with your point of view must kind of know what's going on and must be involved in many, many steps of the story. But by the same token, you've all run into this. You're writing the antagonist, and you don't want to reveal who the antagonist is yet. You want to keep that suspense. So you have to write that as a he, she, or maybe even avoid gender pronouns when you're writing scenes from that person's point of view. This is true in thrillers. You want it to be creepy. You want to be in that person's head, but you don't want the reader to figure out who the bad guy is yet. And that can be very tricky, and there's a lot of examples out there. So what are the different types of point of view? Obviously, first-person point of view. That's the eye character. This is great for uh, detective and private eye fiction because in mysteries, when you're reading, you are, as the reader, 
discovering the evidence and discovering the story and interacting with the characters along with the point of view character, the protagonist. And so first person is perfect for that because you're peeling back the layers of a mystery and you're, you're knowing what the protagonist knows at the same time. And so you're kind of thinking in that person's head. It's also very close. You can get very close in first person because you're really inside that person's head. So you have access to what that person is thinking and how they're they're planning what they're going to do next, what their thought processes are, what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're feeling. Everything about it, you're inside that person's head because first person is by definition very close. This is impactful to the reader because they become invested, deeply invested in that character. So it's wonderful for mysteries. The disadvantages is it can sometimes be awkward with plotting. Um, the character must be present. Um, you can't, as in pure first person, the reader cannot know something that the point of view character doesn't because you're in that person's head and you're only seeing things. You can't step outside of that person and see things that they can't see. That's breaking the rules. You can't do that. So in thrillers, it makes it difficult. Not that it can't be done because you can create thrills by writing in first person, but it surely requires a very deft hand to do that. Why? Well, a mystery, as I said, you peel back things with the protagonist. You're, you're gathering information. You're solving a puzzle. But in a thriller, a, th a true thriller is that the reader has superior knowledge. This reader knows things that the protagonist does not know. That's the thrill. You're saying, oh, no, 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 don't go in there. Oh, don't open that box. Don't, don't go visit that person. Don't do this. Don't do that. Hey, look over your shoulder. You're saying these things to yourself because you know something that the protagonist doesn't know. Well, in pure first person, that's not possible. And it doesn't mean that you can't move along in first person in a thriller and have things happen that are very thrilling and very stressful and very um, difficult for your, for your uh, point of view character. But you run the risk of making that person seem like a doofus. You can't, if the reader's sitting there saying, what? You're going to go do that now? Are you crazy? You, they kind of lose confidence in that character. Of course, that may be what you want. You may want your protagonist to be somewhat of a doofus and kind of stumble into the solution of the problem. So there's many ways of doing this. First person, really great for mysteries, PI, uh, detective stories, less so for, for pure thrillers because you miss that superior knowledge thing. Second person, well, that's the you character where you're talking you all the time. This is pretty creepy. This is hard to do, and it's almost never done. There's very few examples of it in, in crime fiction. Um, it, 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 people just don't like being the you character. They don't like you talking to them that way. It's like, you don't know me. Why are you saying that about me? So let's get to third person, which is the he, she character. Um, and this is really, really interesting because it can be single or multiple, and it can be close or distant. Um, and by that, I mean a single third person point of view is basically substituting he or she for the I character. You can, you, it's only told from that person's point of view. So it's like the I character, everything that goes on, that character's present, that character's sensing and, and feeling and deciding what to do and what to say and how to act and all this. And you're in, you're, you're with that person all the way through the story. And the only difference is, is you're using the third person pronoun instead of the first uh, and it can be just as immediate as we'll see. Multiple is when you're jumping from person to person. And many thrillers are told this way because you have multiple points of view. You have this complex story that's kind of meandering its way along. And, and, and you're seeing the conflicts coming before they actually get there because you have multiple points of view. You know what the bad guy's doing. You know what the good guy's doing. You know what the helper. You know what the... The, the antagonist helper is, you know what all these characters are doing, and you can kind of see this train wreck coming. And that's the beauty of thrillers. But you have to have multiple points of view to do that. Now, close point of view, third person, again, is what I was talking about. 
If you're inside that person's head where you have privy to their thoughts and their feelings and, and every sensation that they're getting, that's very close third person, and it's very much like the I character. If you're more distant, then you're stepping back and you're telling this tale of this person kind of a little bit removed. I think the best way to look at this is like a movie. Where is the camera? In a first person the camera is inside the character's head and the lens is their eyes. You're seeing the world like you live your world. Everything a person knows is what's right in front of them. They don't know anything else. They can only know what they know and it's only what's in front of them. Same way with the first person character. And a close third person is the same way. With distant third person or, or kind of intermediate, that camera's sitting on the shoulder. You're really watching and observing what's going on very closely, but maybe you don't have insights into what's going on into the character's head. And then you move the camera even further back, and it's kind of above and behind, and you're watching this character go through things. When you read fiction, look at where the camera is. When you're writing, look at where the camera is. And remember, this camera can move. You can be sitting back a ways and you can be telling a, a detective who's going into a building to find some guy and talk to him. And you're going through all this kind of, kind of stuff from far back. And then suddenly when you get there, the camera moves in and you're in this person's head. And now they're starting to have thoughts about what they're doing, what they're thinking, how they're going to act, how they're formulating questions, what they think about the person in front of them. And so you've moved the camera in closer. So what is omniscient point of view? Well, this is probably the trickiest and the one that I think is you don't, you don't try in your first few times out of the box. Uh, it's kind of like the, the God point of view. The author is God. You're sitting up there and you can, um, you can uh, get into everybody's head. You can jump from head to head. You can tell what everybody's thinking even in a given scene. You get insights into things that the characters wouldn't even know. You can tell broad broad stroke stories you can tell about the history of a place you can tell about without really being in anybody's point of view. This can be tricky, but you can also mix and match points of view. And in fact, a lot of people do. They'll start with an exhibition paragraphs in certain, certain scenes that kind of explain things and it's not really in anybody's point of view. And then they drop into a character's point of view. Uh, th this happens a lot and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So let's look at some examples of the difference in these and um, and let's just talk about a homicide investigator. So in first person, you might write something like this. I'm a cop, rather a homicide and rather a homicide investigator, have been for many decades, not easy decades, not at all. I've lost partners to the misdeeds of others. I've lost my family to long hours away and the neglect that engenders. I've even lost my soul to alcohol and planted evidence. I've grown to hate the job I once loved. You see how deeply you are into that character's point of view? That's the I character. That's first person, what he's feeling, what he's thinking, what he's about, what his attitudes are. We're right there in his face. Second person point of view. You're a detective. Have been for decades. You know others think that the life of a detective is fascinating and easy, that investigators are mostly out of the line of fire and come to the crime later when, when the who, how, and why must be discovered, that this time lag distances the investigator from the emotional impact of the crime. You know they're wrong. See, that's the you character, and it's like they're talking to you. That's why it's often uncomfortable. Third person. Mac was a homicide investigator. Had been for many decades. Early in his career, he loved the job, the deciphering of the who, what, and why. But lately, things had changed. He no longer jumped from the bed in the morning, eager to attack the case, but rather rolled out slowly, hungover, depressed, no fire in his belly. God, he hated being trapped in this existence. So again, we're, we're kind of closer, but we're not really getting his feelings. We're getting an expository of his feelings. We're a little closer than way, the camera being way far back, but the camera's not really in his head. In other words, we don't know that his head aches and his stomach hurts and, and he's got you know cotton in his mouth because he drank too much the night before and we don't have any memories of what he did last night, that kind of thing. But we're pretty close to him. Omniscient. Homicide investigators are problem solvers, puzzlers who work to fit each evidence item into a bigger and clearer picture. Most have skills in this arena, but none are immune to the effect of such investigations 
lay on their souls. The dead and the damage, the inhumanity one person inflicts on another, the innocents who are caught in the wake of heinous crimes, each takes a toll on every detective's mental faculties and stability, makes cynicism a way of life. Such was the case with Mac Wilson. Less so for Amanda Sims, his partner, a rookie who was just beginning her tenure in the pressure cooker. She still believed in her fellow man. That wouldn't last long. Well, you see, um, you see the difference there. We're talking about Mac. We're talking about what he's feeling. We've, we've, we've told you that he is a cynical, worn-out cop. And then suddenly we're talking about the feelings and the thoughts of Amanda Sims. This is the author telling us about two characters and about a situation and also a broad look at homicide investigators all in one package. So in choosing your overall point of view and your point of view character, look for where the real story drama lies. You want to tell about the character who, who is the most dramatic in this story, the one that can that can push this story emotionally and factually and, and suspensefully forward. Uh, you have lots of choices because there's lots of characters in a story. And like I said, you can be the protagonist or it can be an observer, you know, like, like Scout and Nick that I talked about earlier. And this is not only the overall story, but this is for each scene in the story. Elmore Leonard told me once that he only had one thing on his computer. And he basically had a little card that said, what is the purpose of this scene and from whose point of view should it be told? Now, that's brilliant, but Elmore was brilliant. So in other words, he comes to a scene. He has multiple characters. He's using multiple third-person point of view. Which character in that scene should be telling that scene? Well, who has them? How do you decide that? Well, who has the most at stake or face, faces the greatest conflict in that particular scene? Now, these also fit for the story overall, but right now we're talking about particular scenes. Who will the reader most empathize with and worry about in that scene? And that may not be the point of view character, actually. It may be another, but how you construct it will inform the reader as to, as to who they're going to empathize with and they're going to worry about. Who drives the story? Usually that's the one that, that, that you're going to choose for the scene. And who's affected by that scene? And, and who is the most interesting? Who is it that they want to hear from, the reader wants to hear from, in this particular time in the story? Now, if you're using first person, this is all simple because every one of them is that. If you're using very close third, same thing. But if you're using multiple, multiple points of view, then you have to decide. Also... The character point of view is someone who likes, has to be there for this scene and they have to be involved in what's going on. And so they have to be involved in the climax and the aftermath of it. In other words, it has to affect them. So again, how many points of view do you need? Well, you know, you need to decide which characters drive the plot, which characters enhance the plot, which characters offer help or hindrance to the protagonist. Which ones offer a different perspective on the story? And who offers and increases the suspense of the story? So when you're cobbling your story together and you're building all these scenes, these scenes should, as you know, move the story forward, expose character, create tension, uh, move toward the answer to the story question. You know, what's the story about? What's the answer? The who, what, when, where, and how? So choose those characters. Let me give you some examples from some wonderful writers. <clears throat> and the Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway, of course. First person point of view. I could picture it. I have written, I have a rotten habit of picturing the bedroom scenes of my friends. We went out to the Cafe Napolitain to have an aperitif and watch the evening crowd on the boulevard. Obviously very close, very personal. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by uh, Mark Twain. You don't know me without you have read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain, and he told the truth, mainly. There was things he stretched, but mainly he told the truth. That is nothing. I never seen nobody but lied one time or another without it was Aunt Polly or the widow or maybe Mary. 
pretty cool. And what do we learn? We we really are in the thoughts of this character. We're in the rhythm of this character, how he thinks, how he speaks, everything. Uh, even though he hadn't said anything, he's basically talking to us. But it's first person. You don't know about me. So pretty cool. In The Great Gatsby, we talked about how Nick was the was not the protagonist, but he was the point of view character. When I came back from the East last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with the privileged glimpses into the human heart. Wow. We learn a lot about Nick right there in, in basically a sentence. Um, second person point of view. Uh, probably the, the best example and the most quoted example of this in, 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 liter in, 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 in literature is Bright Lights, Big City by Jay McInerney. You are not the kind of guy who would be at a place like this at this time of the morning, but here you are, and you cannot say the terrain is entirely unfamiliar, although the details are fuzzy. You are at a nightclub talking to a girl with a shaved head. The club is either Heartbreak or the Lizard Lounge. All, all might become clear if you, if you could just slip into the bathroom and do a little more Bolivian marching powder. Then again, it might not. A small voice inside you insists that this epidemic lack of clarity is a result of too much of that already. Wow. So you can see this is the you character. And it now the reader, when is reading this, they become the you character. They're this guy who's this coke freak in this bar trying to wrestle with life. And some people find that very uncomfortable. Um I do. <laughs> so second person point of view is not is not common and, and for a very good reason. Uh, third person. Red Dragon by Thomas Harris. If you don't read any thriller in your life, read this one. It's probably one of the most perfect thrillers ever written. And Thomas Harris, of course, this is the part of the Hannibal Lecter trilogy. But uh, uh, Red Dragon was the first one. Uh, and it's it's wonderful. It begins basically like this. Will Graham sat Crawford down at a picnic table between his house and the ocean and gave him a glass of iced tea. Jack Crawford looked at the pleasant old house, salt-silvered wood in the, in the clear light. I should have caught you in Marathon when you got off work, he said. You don't want to talk about, the, talk about it here. I don't want to talk about it anywhere, Jack. You've got, to, you've got to talk about it, so let's have it. Just don't get out any pictures. If you brought pictures... Leave them in the briefcase. Molly and Willie will be back soon. Well, we learn a lot there. Obviously, it's third person. It's in Jack Crawford's point of view because he looked at the Pleasant House. He saw that. But we also learn a lot about Will Graham just from the dialogue. But that's third person. This is from my, my book, Hot Lights, Cold Steel. This is going to be totally cool. Dead bodies. Carmelita had never seen one, much less two. Would they be gross, smell bad? She had heard that they smelled like rotting eggs. What if she threw up? How embarrassing. Still, she'd have a great story to tell and a ring to show off. She had been scheduled to work until 11 11 a.m., until 1 a.m., but this was definitely worth dumping a couple of hours. Besides, it wasn't that busy and the tips had been lousy. Some nights were just that way. Maybe if this had been a payday Friday, she'd have stayed, but a dead Wednesday? No contest. So you can see that we're in her point of view and we're sensing what she's feeling, but we're, it's the she character, not the I character. Omniscient point of view. So this is where things are um, told like a lens above watching the action. We're not in any particular character's head. We can move from one to the other if we want to. Or we can just simply observe like the camera in the sky. And this is from The Dawn Patrol by Don Winslow. Great book. The girls look like ghosts. Coming out of the early morning mist, their silver forms emerge from a thin line of trees as the girls pad through the wet grass that edges the field. The dampness muffles their footsteps, so they approach silently. The mist that wraps around their legs makes them look as if they're floating like spirits who died as children. There are eight of them, and they are children. The oldest is 14, the youngest 10. They walk toward the waiting men in unconscious lockstep. 
The men bend over the mist like giants over clouds peering down into their universe. But the men aren't giants, they're workers, and their universe is the seemingly endless strawberry fields that they do not rule, but that rules them. They're glad for this cool mist. It will burn off soon enough and lead them to the sun's indifferent mercy. Well, you can see that there are multiple angles on this story. First of all, who's seeing these girls coming out of the mist? Who's seeing their forms? Who senses that they're padding on the grass and the dampness muffles the footsteps? Who's listening? Uh, and then the, the men, the men, then they talk about the girls walking in unconscious lockstep. Well, that's almost in their point of view, though it could be in the point of view of an observer that they don't look like they're conscious, but it could be in the girl's point of view that they're really, they're really just not focused on what's going on, that they're, they're shell shocked, if you will. Obviously these young girls are, who are brought in to be prostitutes for these guys, obviously against their will. And then the men, they're bending down. They don't rule the field. The, 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 the field rules them, and they're glad for the cool mist. Well, that's in their point of view. But you can see this is really stepping back and looking down on this incredible scene, and it goes on from there, um, as, as, as God would look, look down on the story and as the author would look down on the story. And that's, that's pretty cool. Um, now, you know, I talked earlier about sometimes you start in an authorial or omniscient point of view, and then you move into another point of view. And often it, this is in, in crime fiction. You'll see this where you're setting the stage, you're, you're giving a flavor for what's going on, but then you're dropping into the point of view of one of the characters. So this is from my book, Run to Ground. It's my third Dub Walker book, and, and it's, uh, this is Dub. And it starts omniscient, and it moves into the I character, because in, the, in that series, I used the first person for all the Dub scenes and multiple third for all the others. Um, a technique I learned from James Patterson, and I've used it in a couple of series, and I, and I like it that way. My Jake Longley series is written the same way, first and then multiple third. So this is Run to Ground. The Tennessee River sagged into North Alabama like a slack guitar string, waiting to be tightened to the proper key. From its origins at the confluence of the Holston and French Broad Rivers near Knoxville, Tennessee, until it emptied into the Ohio River near Paducah, Kentucky, it covered over 650 miles. The river was home to nine Tennessee Valley Authority hydroelectric, dam hydroelectric dams, which supplied power to a large chunk of the southeast. The city of Huntsville, as well as the Redstone Arsenal Marshall Space Flight Center, nestled against the river near the bottom of its Alabama swag. Like most southern cities, Huntsville was small, though the population was around 160,000, and it was spread over 175 square miles. You could drive 15 minutes in any direction and be lost in rural America. No city lights, no traffic, just fertile farmland where rabbits, squirrels, doves, and crows abounded. Land where cotton was keen for so many years. Still was, though it had been joined by corn and soybeans and a handful of other food crops. I stood at the back of my property and looked out over the city, the redstone arsenal, the rolling green hills, and the thick patches of forest that surrounded both. The cloudless blue sky, the gentle breeze from the west, and the pink and white dogwoods that bloomed along the edge of my property offered no hint to the horrors that lay in those hills and forest patches. None of the people driving unhurriedly along Memorial Parkway could have guessed that at this very moment excavation crews were pulling body after body from the ground. Before sunset they would know, but right now life went on as if it were just another perfect April day. Well, you can see that started in an omniscient, authorial point of view and then moved into Dub's head as he's standing uh, on the back of his property on Montesano Mountain. Point of view can be tricky and it can also be easy. So to kind of summarize some of what I've said here, um, point of view can be first, it can be second, it can be third, and third can be multiple, it can be close, it can be distant, uh, etc. like I talked about. You can use omniscient point of view, you can use that for parts of the story, you can mix and match all of these things. 
I think the key in understanding point of view is understanding where the camera lens is located. I think that will keep you out of trouble. If you look at first person and the, cam and the camera is inside the person's head and you're looking through their eyes, when you're writing the entire story, any scene that is in first person or if the entire story is in, in first person like that, remember, the character, the reader, can only know what is in front of this person's eyes what the camera lens is looking at. You can't know what's going on in the next room or down the street or in the next city. You can't know that. You can be told that, but again, that's right in front of the person's face. They can read about it. They can see it on TV. They can hear it on the radio, but they cannot, you cannot have a scene out of their point of view. Second person, eh, forget about it. Third person, uh, the, the, the he, she character, remember, here, the camera can be inside the head, very close, close third person, where all the sensations and everything just like first person is happening. It can be on the person's shoulder, which is a step removed. You can still get a little bit of what's going on, but it's not the deep feelings and the deep understandings that go on in the first or very close th third. It's a little bit more distant, but you're still right there observing everything close up and personal that this person's doing. Or that camera can be moved back. And it can be on the wall hanging behind the character who's in a scene having a discussion in an office with someone, very critical scene to the story, but you're kind of observing and reporting it from a distance. So you're not in the character's head. You're not getting their sensations and feelings. You're kind of reporting the story. And so and that camera can move back and forth. So you can be reported and suddenly you can jump down into that person's deep point of view and have a reaction to what's going on in this scene. And then you can move it back out and start telling more of the scene. And omniscient is where the camera is up in the air looking down on everything. And you can head hop. You can do all that stuff. You can have uh, authorial stuff thrown in so that you're basically telling the story. And this is how most of us sit around uh, somewhere and tell stories to people. We're kind of hopping around and, and, and doing all this, but it's hard to do. It's hard to do. And I think if you're a, a beginning writer and you haven't written quite a few books, the omniscient point of view can be, it sounds easy. Oh Lord, it sounds so easy, but it's not. It's very, very, very difficult. So choose your right point of view, choose your right uh, point of view character, tell your story, and uh, you'll be fine. So I hope this has helped some. And until next time, I'll be signing off here on Criminal Mischief. Uh, this is D.P. Lyle. And uh, I hope this helped you understand point of view. Until next time.